the rain comes down hard on the North Atlantic. A deep pounding rhythm on a turf roof built a thousand years ago. You can almost hear the wool cloaks getting heavier, smell the wet earth, pulling heat from a man's bones twice as fast as dry cold ever could. Out there in Newfoundland, in Greenland, in the long houses of Norway, firewood is soaked useless. No flame, no comfort, just rain wind and a night that wants to take everything. And yet he pulls the animal hide a little higher, letting the water slide off like a makeshift roof. He shifts closer to the raised bench, the only barrier between his body and the freezing ground. It isn't strength that keeps him alive, it's knowledge, it's technique. It's the quiet skill every Viking carried when the world turned cold and cruel. So the question is, without fire, how did they stay warm through a night like this? The rain beats on the turf roof with that deep North Atlantic sound, heavy, steady, unforgiving. Inside the longhouse at Lanceau Meadows, the floor glistens in the dim, fireless, dark cold, enough to rob a man's heat twice as fast as any dry winter night. You can almost hear his breath turning white. You can almost feel the weight of a wool cloak soaked through pulling at his shoulders like an anchor. And in a night like this, if he lets his body touch the ground even for a moment, the cold wins. Every single time. That is why the Vikings did something simple and brilliant. When archaeologists cut into the floors of that Canadian longhouse, they didn't find guesswork. They found engineering, layered, intentional, battle-tested engineering. First came a thick bed of dry moss, nature's sponge, soaking up the moisture that would have drained the life out of them. Above that, a mat of grass and sedges giving loft and airflow, the same way a modern hiker prizes a sleeping pad. And on the very top, heavy animal hides thick enough to trap body heat and send it right back into whoever lay there. Watch him now, third person close enough to feel the air he breathes. He adjusts the hide over his shoulder, shifts his weight onto that layered bed, and the cold suddenly slows. The earth no longer steals from him. His kids curl up beside him, sharing warmth without a single word. That is masculine tenderness at its finest quiet, practical necessary. And here is the truth a modern man needs to hear. The Vikings didn't survive nights like this because they were fearless or fierce. They survived because they understood the ground beneath them. They used moss grass and hide the way we use gear and gadgets. Knowledge not muscle kept them alive. You want to beat the cold? Start with the oldest rule in the north, never let the earth touch you. The rain cuts across the turf roof in long, cold sheets, the kind of storm that slides into every crack of a house and chills the air from the inside out. On a night like this, the wind doesn't howl. It creeps. It slips through the longhouse, stealing warmth one breath at a time. And with no dry firewood, nothing to spark, nothing to burn. Most people today would call it quits. But a Viking doesn't quit. He leans on something older, something smarter. Watch him move deeper into the longhouse, closer to the earth-banked wall. That wall isn't just dirt. Archaeologists in Iceland and Greenland found turf blocks stacked one to two meters thick, dense layers of soil roots and grass cut from the land itself. Heavy, wet-proof, heat-holding, a natural barrier built to stop the storm at the door. When he presses his back near it, the cold doesn't rush him anymore. The turf slows the wind. It traps the warmth of his own body, forming a tiny microclimate the same way a well-insulated cabin works today. He slides into the sleeping niche carved deep into that thick wall, a narrow space roofed by wood and packed with hide. It's not comfortable in the modern sense, but it's dry. It's protected, and with each minute, the heat he breathes out warms the little pocket of air around him. His child curls closer. The wall does the rest, holding the warmth like a silent partner. This is masculine tenderness at its core. Quiet protection through skill, not noise, no gadgets, no heater. Just knowledge passed down through storms exactly like this. And that's the genius of turf houses. They weren't just shelters. 
They were natural central heating systems built out of earth, designed by people who understood cold better than we ever will. On a night of heavy rain and freezing wind, toughest the toughest thing, thing in the, the longhouse wasn't the man. It was the wall, it was beside, the wall him. beside him. The longhouse is dark tonight, darker than usual, because there's no fire. The rain has been falling for hours, slipping through the turf roof in tiny beads, tapping on the wool cloaks hung on the wall. Cold air pools low along the floor, moving like a slow river. Every breath turns white. Every footstep feels like standing on a block of ice. If you sleep down there on the ground, you don't stand a chance. Watch him third person close enough to feel what he feels. He gathers his family and moves them toward the raised sleeping benches that run along the longhouse walls. Those benches weren't decorative. Archaeologists found them in Borg and Trelleborg. For one reason, cold air stays low, warm air stays higher. It's physics, old simple physics. They press close shoulder to shoulder, three bodies forming one slow burning furnace. He drapes a heavy hide over the outside edge, turning it into a makeshift wall so the dripping roof can't reach them. One hide, one bench, three people. And something begins to change. The heat builds, the air softens, and for the first time tonight, somebody exhales without shivering. It's shared body heat nature's heater. The same trick you use when the power goes out and everyone crowds into one room under the thickest blanket in the house. No pride, no bravado, just survival done right. And this is where the respect sets in. The Vikings didn't win these nights by yelling at the storm or flexing their muscles. They won by understanding how warmth moves, how bodies give and take heat, and how a longhouse can be shaped to keep a family alive even when the rain tries to break it. Hero of the night. It isn't the bench. It isn't the hide. It's the breath of the people huddled together, quiet, steady, warm. The rain hits harder now. You can hear it in the longhouse. That heavy tapping on wool cloaks hung near the doorway, each drop sinking and adding weight. A soaked cloak is a curse out here. Wool that's wet turns cold, and cold wool steals heat faster than the night itself. Most men today would strip it off and pray for a heater. A Viking does something different, something smarter. Watch him in the dim light. He takes his outer cloak, thick Vadmal wool, and runs his hand across the surface. It glistens not because it's soaked, but because it's treated. Archaeologists at Oseberg and Gokstad found lipid traces, residues of animal fat and fish oil rubbed deep into the fibers. Waterproofing, primitive maybe, but incredibly effective. That thin sheen turns each raindrop into a bead that slides right off. He drapes the cloak over his shoulders again, pulling it tight against the storm. The water rolls down the outside and never reaches the underlayers. No chill bleeding through. No cold compressor effect. Just a dry inner core where his body heat can stay trapped long enough for sleep. He shifts closer to his family. A child presses into his side. And in that small act, one man shielding another with nothing but a treated wool cloak, there's masculine tenderness at its purest. Quiet protection, no big speech, just skill, doing what bravery alone cannot. Modern folks think waterproofing needs a store-bought jacket, some high-tech membrane. But the Vikings knew better. One layer of fat, one well-made cloak, and they could survive nights that would freeze most campers solid. That's the thing about ancient knowledge, it isn't loud, it isn't fancy, but it works. A single coat of oil, one smart decision, and a whole family makes it through the rain. One layer of fat kept them alive. The rain doesn't fall tonight, it attacks. It comes sideways, driven by a North Atlantic wind, sharp enough to cut through wool and pride all at once. Inside the longhouse, the cloaks hung near the doorway, sag with the weight of water. Every drop makes them heavier. Every minute makes them colder. A wet hide is a natural refrigerator, and any man wearing one for long knows exactly how fast it can drain the heat from his body. Now watch him. Third person close enough to hear the cloak slap against his arm as he lifts it. He doesn't put it on. Not in this storm. 
Instead, he angles it just a little, turning it into a slanted roof in the one direction the rain is driving. The Vikings did this instinctively. They used hides like mobile awnings. And when they needed anchors, they used what they had fish bones carved and sharpened, pressed into turf, or tied to beams, so the cloak held its shape against the wind. The effect is instant. Less rain hits the sleeping space. Less fabric gets soaked. Less heat bleeds out of the body. It's the same logic you use standing in a winter parking lot, trying to find the one spot where the wind won't knife through your jacket. Find the angle, find the shelter, and the cold suddenly becomes a problem you can manage. He settles under that narrow rain shadow his family tucked in behind him, dry enough to keep the warmth they still have. And in that moment, you realize the hero of the night isn't the longhouse, or the fire they don't have, but the hide itself. A simple animal skin positioned just right becomes the thin line between freezing and surviving. One angle, one cloak, one pocket of dry air in a storm that wants everything. The storm has settled into its rhythm now, a long cold drumming on the turf roof that seeps into the bones of the longhouse. No fire tonight, no glowing stones pulled from a hearth, just darkness, wet wool, and the kind of cold that crawls across the floor like a living thing. In weather like this, even the rocks are enemies. A cold stone will drain a man's warmth the way a sponge pulls water, but watch him third person close enough to see how he thinks. He crouches near the back wall and gathers a handful of small stones, the smooth kind you find near the shoreline, not to heat them. He can't, not without firewood. Instead, he stacks them in a tight cluster at the corner of the sleeping space. Then he draws a heavy fur over the pile, trapping it the same way you'd trap steam under a pot lid. It's simple physics. In a tight, enclosed space, every breath is heat. Every exhale raises the temperature by a fraction. Those stones cold at first soak it in. Minutes pass. The fur warms. The stones warm and suddenly the longhouse has a small, steady reservoir of heat. Not hot enough to scorch, but warm enough to keep the air around them stable. A microclimate. Primitive. Effective. Archaeologists have found these little stone groupings in Viking coastal sites, never burned, never part of a fire pit. Just there. Right where people slept. Quiet evidence of quiet survival. He settles down beside the covered pile, the child at his side, already drifting towards sleep. And for the first time tonight, the cold loosens its grip. That's the contrast that saves them stone, that once bit with cold, now giving back gentle warmth. Cold to warm, enemy to ally, rock to lifeline. Sometimes survival is nothing more than using what the earth gives back. The rain hasn't stopped for hours. Just a steady cold whisper on the turf roof, the kind that never gets loud, but never lets you forget it's there. The longhouse feels damp from the floor up. These weren't wide roomy beds. Viking sleeping niches were often barely wider than a man's shoulders, tight wooden or turf frame pockets that trapped air and made every breath count. Every board, every fur, every breath carries a hint of moisture. And when you lie on your back, in weather like this, that moisture wins. Cold drops find your face. Damp air gathers around your nose. Before long, your own breath chills you from the inside. But watch him third person close enough to hear the soft scrape of wool as he shifts. He doesn't lie flat. He rolls forward onto his belly and slightly to the side the way hunters and sailors sleep when the weather turns mean. It keeps rain out of the face and it keeps the chest low and warm. Then he pulls the cloak down, not tight, but just enough to make a small hollow of space in front of his mouth. A breath pocket, a tiny dome of warm air that traps each exhale before it escapes into the cold. It's simple, it's clever, and it works. Within minutes, the air in that pocket warms, his breathing steadies, his body relaxes, and the cold that once pressed against his lungs starts to back off. Archaeologists have noted these face shelters in ethnographic parallels across northern cultures, proof that the trick wasn't improvisation. 
It was tradition. It's the same thing you do when the power goes out in winter and you hide under a blanket leaving that one warm pocket to breathe in. No heater, no gadget, just your own breath doing the job. Tonight that breath is the hero, the smallest fire a Viking ever carried, burning quietly under a cloak in the middle of a storm. Warm breath, warm pocket, warm sleep. Outside the rain still falls, the wind still circles the longhouse like a hungry animal, but inside the Vikings sleep. No fire, no dry wood, just knowledge. They beat the cold, not with flame, but with understanding of earth, of wool, of breath of heat that the body gives freely if you treat it right. And maybe that's what we've lost relying on heaters and thermostats to do our thinking for us. Because when the storm hits and the power's out, it's not the gadget that keeps you alive. It's the skill. So tell me, what happens when it isn't rain but a blizzard?